Welcome to the lecture for research methods. Uh, we'll be talking about correlational and quasi-experimental uh, research. Uh, first of all, it's more to kind of distinguish how these these types of research, these research uh, uh, designs, are different from experimental research, which we've already um, talked about uh, a good bit. In terms of correlational research, uh, it's different from experimental in terms of you don't really do anything to the participants. There's no uh, manipulation of an independent variable. You're simply uh, measuring um, variables, traits, or characteristics of your participants. You're not uh, doing anything to them. Uh, in quasi-experimental research, um, things may uh, be done to participants, but you can't assign individuals to levels of the independent variable if this happens. Uh, with quasi-experimental research, it can also be sort of like correlational where you're not doing things, like if you're looking at um, difference between, uh, are there gender differences on some trait? Uh, some would argue that that's quasi-experimental. Um, I would argue it's closer to really correlational. Correlational is really when you're trying to do uh, an experimental type thing, and you're trying to look at cause and effect, but you just can't assign individuals to, level, to levels of the variable um, for some particular reason. And for both of these, you cannot directly infer causation from your results. Uh, all you can say is, you know, either there is a relationship, or there is a difference between groups, depending if you're doing correlational or uh, quasi-experimental. <coughs> so a little bit uh, more closely at correlational research. Uh, the goal is to identify the degree which uh, variables are related. You know, so you know, does a person's amount of uh, X tell you anything about the amount of Y that they will have or show? And is there a relationship between these two variables? Um, for example, is there a relationship between level of education and income. Um, so when you're talking about these relationships, you generally think, you know, is it a strong relationship? And if it, uh, if you have a strong relationship, then knowing a person's level on some variable, on say variable X, uh, if you know that, then you're confident you could predict their level on variable Y, right? If there's a strong relationship between X and Y. Also, if a person's level on variable X changes a particular amount, then you're confident you could predict how their level on variable Y would change um, or would have changed as well. Uh, an example would be uh, if you're measuring uh, intelligence, get an IQ score from the, the WISC, right, a child uh, measure of intelligence, uh, and then also looking at that same person or same people's IQ scores on the Woodcock Johnson. Just a different IQ test. They're pretty similar. They have people doing similar things. People who score high on the WISC will score high on the Woodcock-Johnson. People who score low on the WISC will score low on the Woodcock-Johnson. Um, and these are really two different measures of the same thing, so not surprising that you should expect a strong relationship between scores on those two tests. Uh, things may be related but may not be that strong of a relationship, right? Kind of a weak relationship. Um, this is whenever, if you know a person's level on variable X, and you have some idea uh, what their level on variable Y would be, but the confidence and accuracy of that prediction is, is limited. An example would be uh, IQ score on the WISC and um, level of creative achievement. They're somewhat related, but there are plenty of really creative people that have pretty high IQ scores and some that have fairly low IQ scores. There's enough of a relationship there that we can say, yes, there is a relationship, but it's not a real strong one. So knowing that, knowing um, about one variable doesn't tell you a whole lot about um, the other variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then also there's the possibility there could be no relationship between um, two variables. Um, so knowing a person's level in variable X doesn't tell you anything about the, what their level in variable Y might be. An uh, example would be uh, IQ score on the WISC and weight. There's no correlation between those two variables. Um, no differences in intelligence, uh, or systematic differences in intelligence related to differences in weight. Hmm? Um, okay, when we're looking at uh, correlation research, uh, we can look at the relationship between two variables or among multiple variables, depending on the exact type of study you're, you're looking at. Uh, either way you're doing, the variables that you're looking at can fall into one of two categories. Predictor variables and criterion variables. Right? So predictor variables, um, this is the, the variable or variables you're predicting with. Right? So let's say uh, if you know X and you want to predict Y, then X is your predictor. It's the thing you know and you're predicting with. 
uh, example, if you're trying to predict um, which NBA team um, will will win uh, the championship based on the average height of players on each team. And so I'm trying to predict who's going to win based on height of the players. So average height of the players is my predictor variable. Um, and the criterion variable um, is the outcome you're predicting, right? So, in the, for example, which team will win? That's what I'm trying to predict. That's the criterion, the outcome. Um, in the correlation research, we're looking at um, you know relationships, and there are different types of relationships, kind of mathematically speaking. Uh, we can break it down into um, two uh, two basic types. Uh, the most common we look at in terms of the stats that you probably are familiar with would be looking at linear relationships between uh, variables. Um, <coughs> this is one thing way you can think of it is if you charted the relationship between two variables, the relationship would look like a line. Right? So changes in variable x will, will lead to a set amount of changes in variable y. Right? And it's always uh, the amount of change uh, is a constant. Um, so you know IQ score in the whisk and IQ score in the Craig Johnson. It's a linear relationship. Um, but they might also be uh, interested in curvilinear relationships. And at, le at least two types of curves we, we think about uh, kind of an asymmetric uh, curve, you know, one that um, uh, starts uh, kind of flat and then gets more steep, or starts steep and then gets flatter. Uh, when it's that, either way, basically um, you have ch the changes. Uh, well, one example would be. Uh, where initially small changes in x correspond to small changes in y at low levels of x. But as you get to larger levels of x, then small changes in x correspond to large changes in y. Uh, an example of an asymmetric curvilinear relationship would be the um, relationship between the amount of stimulus and the sensation uh, it produces. So this is an example I heard from the web looking at uh, as the stimulus increases, how do you um, what do you how how much do you notice the the difference? Right? And it's not a straight linear relationship; it's a curvilinear uh, relationship. Uh, the other type of curvilinear relationship would be uh, any type of kind of symmetric curve. Uh, and this happens when this happens, the direction of the relationship changes depending on the value of x. Uh, example I show here is um, classic one of anxiety and performance. So at low levels of anxiety, there's this positive relationship, right, where at low levels of anxiety, you start to increase anxiety, performance gets better, but up to a point, then you have this kind of diminishing returns where now, at higher levels of anxiety, as anxiety continues to increase, performance then begins to decrease. And uh, depending on what type of relationship um, you're looking at will impact what statistical test you use. Um, here I kind of focus more on just linear relationships. Even among linear relationships, there's different types of tests. The most common one we think about would be bivariate correlations, right? Looking at the relationship between just two variables. Um, and the type of bivariate correlation you use depends on what form the data are in. Most commonly, both variables are um, continuous, right? And when that happens, you use a Pearson R. Uh, there are different correlations if your data um, are ordinal um, or in any other kind of format, you might have different. Um, uh, different correlational uh, statistics, but the most common one again is the, the Pearson R. Uh, it generates, uh, and they all generate a correlation coefficient, right? That R, which ranges in value from negative one to one, and both negative one and one represent perfect relationships, right? where um, we have perfect predictability. If we know uh, there's a, a constant, uh, an expectable level of change, uh, change in X corresponds to an expectable level of change uh, <coughs> in Y. Um, so the two things are perfectly, perfectly related. As that correlation gets closer to zero, away from the ends of negative one and one it draws to the middle, the correlation gets closer to R equals zero, that indicates there's no relationship, or at least no linear uh, relationship, or system there are changes in one variable aren't systematically related to changes in another variable. Uh, so, looking at the correlation coefficient, the sign tells you the direction of the relationship. Uh, a negative correlation uh, is a negative relationship uh, where as values you increase on one, you, it decreases on the other. Or if you decrease on one, it increases in the, in the other. You can, you can look at it either way. Just think about it as any kind of inverse relationship. 
like uh, the, the the amount the amount of time uh, you spend uh, watching TV and uh, your GPA should, should be inversely correlated. Where people who watch more TV score ha have lower GPAs, and people who have lower GPAs watch more TV. Right? Um, and if it's a positive correlation, you know, above zero, positive correlation, that means that th they co-vary in the same direction. So as one increases, the other increases, or as one decreases, the other decreases. So study time and GPA should be positively correlated. The more you study, the higher the GPA. The less you study, the lower the GPA. So the sign tells you the direction. The further away it gets from zero, um, the, the stronger the relationship. In terms of kind of really quantifying how strong the relationship is, we look at something called the coefficient of determination, um, which for this is just the square of the R. So if you have a correlation of 0.5, the coefficient of determination is 0.5 times 0.5, which is equal to 0.25. And that's helpful because if two things have a correlation of 0.5, the coefficient of determination is 0.25, which is 25%, right, if we convert it to a, a percentile. And that's significant because with a correlation of 0.5, that means that the variability in X accounts for 25% of the variability in Y. So if two things are perfectly correlated, correlation of 1 or negative 1, the coefficient of determination is 1, and you can account for all the variability in x with the variability in y. And really that only happens if you're measuring the exact same thing two different ways. Like if you're measuring uh, height using centimeters and height using inches, as long as you're measuring accurately, those, things, those two sets of measurements will have uh, r equals um, 1.0 correlation, and the variability. Uh, in one group in height in inches is the same as the variability in that group in um, centimeters. Um, <coughs> okay, so pretty straightforward for, for bivariate correlations. Uh, and there's some other types of correlations we won't go into right now. But the other kind of big group of tests uh, would be um, different types of regression, uh, multiple regression. Uh, and this is whenever you want to look at um, multiple predictors, how they relate to uh, as they relate to each other, how they predict some criteria. Uh, when you're looking at multiple regression, uh, it'll generate uh, these things called beta weights, which are conceptually like little correlations, right, for each predictor in the criterion um, separately. And doing multiple regression, looking at the beta weights, you can tell which predictor has the strongest relationship with the criterion, uh, and you can see how well uh, prediction of the criterion can be improved by adding or deleting predictors. Right, so if you're saying, trying to figure out, okay, what predicts suicide, uh, uh, suicide, uh, suicidal actions, and you have all these variables, you put them all in the multiple regression and figure out, okay, all these ten variables, it's significant regression, that's great, but really, I can predict just as well with five of those variables as with all ten. So in real world sense, you say, okay, I'm only, I'm only going to ask questions about those five variables and not waste the time with the others because they don't add anything to the predictive validity. Right, and that's something that multiple regression. Uh, can do for you is tell you what things um, are needed to predict some criterion. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so when looking at the results of your statistical test, you're always, as we've talked about before, looking for statistical significance. Uh, and sometimes you won't find statistical significance. You won't find kind of mathematical evidence for a relationship. You won't find a significant correlation or a significant um, regression. But in reality, there is a relationship present. And that can happen uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the big ones is a truncated range. And this has to do uh, usually with how you selected your sample. Um, so like if we say, um, does uh, GRE predict um, how well you do in grad school? And the answer for most people is no. And for, uh, for you all, and for most people in graduate school, no, it doesn't predict well at all. But, and here's where you get the thing, if we gave the GRE to everybody, children, older adults, all kinds of people, it would predict pretty well who would do well in, uh, in grad school. But the thing is, people who want to go to grad school, who have taken a lot of undergrad courses, who know a lot of stuff already, are the only ones that take the GRE. So you have this truncated range. You're looking at only one portion of the people in terms of 
uh, academic skills and knowledge and all these things, you're restricting the range, this truncated range of individuals. And you're trying to predict GPA in grad school with this test score, and it doesn't work for that group. If we had put everybody in there and everybody had gone to grad school and had gotten the GPA, then yeah, it, it would have a significant uh, correlation. But for graduate students, it doesn't predict well because of the truncated range. Um, an even kind of maybe more obvious example. Um, uh, I, I look at a measure of aggression and the number of times uh, you've been arrested. Uh, most people say, yeah, that probably that makes sense. That more aggressive people probably get in trouble with law more often and more likely to get arrested. Probably not a big correlation, but a big enough sample, I could probably find a small, uh, small correlation. If I looked at just the people in this class, probably wouldn't find that. Because again, Trump had a range. And even more than that, I'd probably have no variability. Probably in this class, uh, nobody or very few people have been arrested, at least for <laughs> violent crimes, uh, let's hope. Um, and I can't uh, find a correlation if there's no variability. If everybody is the same on either one of the variables, you're not going to find a significant correlation. You can't predict variability with no variability. So you have to have uh, some diversity in your sample on the variable you're looking at to find significance. If everybody is at the same IQ level and you're trying to predict something with IQ, even if there is a relationship between those two variables, you're not going to find it if there's no variability. You've got to have variability in both of your variables to find any kind of relationship. Okay? So you've got to have um, a wide range of people and you have to have variability in both of the variables that you're, lo you're looking at. Uh, and then thirdly, you might be looking at the wrong type of relationship. So, <clears throat> uh, let's say you're looking at uh, the relationship between um, uh, climate, between heat, uh, how hot it's outside, and aggression. And you get uh, a wide range um, of temperatures um, from very hot to very cold, and you get a wide, large population, and you find zero correlation. Could happen if you're looking with just kind of a regular Pearson R linear relationship type thing because the relationship between heat and aggression seems to be curvilinear, right? So aggression goes up as it gets hotter, but then when it gets to a certain amount of heat, aggression, aggressive acts start to come down. And it's too hot to go out and get into fights. Right? And because it goes up and down, when you look at it with a, in a linear way, it's going to cut right across the middle of that curve and look like a correlation of zero. Same thing the other way. If you're looking for a curve linear relationship but the actual relationship is linear, you won't find simple results either. So you want to make sure you're, you're looking at the right type of relationship. Okay. So with uh, correlational research, um, we, we've got some limitations in terms of what we can uh, conclude. Right? We can't infer causality because it's not an experiment. And because we, we're kind of missing that piece and we're not assigning people to groups, we're not doing stuff to people, the importance of measurement validity really um, increases. Because right? this is where you can exert some, uh, some control and some, uh, some skill in designing a study to make sure that you're measuring what you say you're measuring. Because what you have to conclude about, these, about our relationship between variables hinges almost entirely on how you measure those variables. Right? So, Figuring out how to measure something really well and really accurately with, high, with a high level of construct validity becomes very, very important when doing correlational research. <coughs> so we know we can't infer causation. Well, why not? As you, I'm sure, have heard before, but I'll just iterate one more time. Uh, two main reasons: directionality. Right? If there's a correlation between variables, A and B are are related. We don't know if A caused B or B caused A. Right? So if we find uh, a correlation between um, sun exposure and mood, where more sun exposure is associated with more positive mood, okay, well, is it that being out in the sun makes people feel better? Or is it that when people feel better, they're more likely to go out and be in the sun? And people who are depressed stay home in the dark. Right? We don't know which variable, which way the, the, the flow of causality uh, goes if we didn't assign people to go outside or not go outside, right? There's no correlation. We're just asking people, hey, how much have you gone outside? What's your mood like? And if we're just asking people stuff, we're not manipulating anything, then we don't know about the direction of the causal relationship. 
Uh, and the other big one would be the third variable, where if there's a correlation between A and B, it could be that it's explained by some causal relationship where A causes C, which causes B. Um, and the example I always cite is that there is a correlation between a uh, number of ashtrays in people's houses and um, likelihood of getting cancer. Right? And having ashtrays doesn't cause cancer. But ashtrays are associated with smoking, and smoking, smoking is associated in a causal way with cancer. And so there's that third variable that explains the relationship between, between two other variables. So if it can't, you can't infer a causation, well, why would you use it? Why wouldn't you just do everything uh, experimentally? Uh, well, lots of reasons. One would be you might be interested in multiple levels uh, of a variable. Right? So uh, in an experiment, um, think about like a, a drug study. We, we do uh, with the drug, without the drug. That's two groups. Well, say, so I, I, I want to know about um, how much of the drug uh, affects people. Well, I could do, okay, um, no drug, low dose, high dose. Now I've got to have a certain number of people in each of those groups, right? And as I, well, if I want to do no drug, really low, slightly low, medium, slightly big, really big. The more kind of I divide it up, the more people I have to have in groups to maintain statistical power, and the more tests I'll be doing to compare group A to group B to group C to group D, so on and so forth. So if I really want to know about, well, at all levels of the drug, people at really high, slightly less than that, what's the, what's the relationship with these symptoms, it might make more sense to do a correlational study where I just look at how much of the drug people are taking and what their symptoms are like. And then I can get all kinds of variability uh, and see if there is any kind of linear, consistent relationship. And I might find that there's not um, a linear relationship. Maybe it's this kind of step function where uh, between 0 and 10 milligrams, there's no, uh, no effect. And then between 10 and 20, everybody in that group has the same amount of symptoms. Maybe, maybe not. But looking at the correlation, I can find that. I can find if it is, it, is this weird kind of step thing, like looking graphically at the data, or is the smooth linear function, or is it even a curvilinear relationship? Um, so I might be interested in multiple levels of the variable um, that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, sometimes I just can't uh, manipulate the, the independent variable uh, for ethical or, or practical uh, reasons. Right, if I want to know. Uh, the relationship between, um, well, uh, infidelity, repeated infidelities, and um, partner uh, violence. I can't go out and tell people, okay, I need you to cheat on your spouse uh, six times, I need you to cheat on your spouse three times, I need you to cheat on your spouse zero times. And I want to see uh, how often um, partner violence occurs in a relationship. I can't, can't do that. But I can go out and I can give service people and just measure how frequently they um, cheated on their partner, and I can measure, I can ask them how frequently they engaged in or were uh, victims of partner violence. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, sometimes I don't want to manipulate an interval, or I don't want high levels of experimental control. Right? Maybe I want a more naturalistic design. I want to see what happens in a natural setting. Right. Um, you know, this is what I really am maybe focusing more on external validity and not that concerned with internal validity. Maybe I've already, they've already established that, you know, A can cause B, and I want to find if it happens in the real world. Right? People find, okay, well, um, this is kind of a silly example, but um, people run faster uh, when being chased uh, by a bigger bear. Right? And they found that in a lab setting by some people pictures of bears and measuring their heart rate, and they kind of extrapolate from that, well, you probably run faster. But would you really? Is that higher heart rate really correspond to faster running or not? Well, one, one way to do it, I could go out and watch people that come across bears. And again, ethically, I can't, uh, um, and it wouldn't be realistic to tell people, okay, you're going to go in the forest and there's going to be a bear, uh, I'm going to watch how fast you run. That's not real world. Real world would be just watching campers, and whenever a bear comes up, the person starts to run, measure how fast they run, and measure how big the bear is. Now I've got a very naturalistic design, and I can see um, if that kind of lab finding really does generalize to uh, the real world. Okay. Uh, silly example, but anyway. Uh, Quasi-experimental research, um, similar in many ways, but also maybe a bit different. Uh, its goal, 
broadly um, stated is to identify group differences. All right, so um, are men and women different on something? Are uh, people who have previous military experience different from people who don't have previous military experience? Right? Where again, I can't assign people to one group or the other, but I'm, I want to know if these groups uh, are different. Uh, now, with some quasi experiment research, the goal is to examine some sort of cause effect relationship, where you want to examine cause effect but you can't really do it uh, in the same way as you would with an experiment. Um, so you have to be cautious about how you report results of a quasi-experimental study, but to make uh, your argument for a cause effect relationship stronger, there's some things uh, you can do. Right? You exert as much experimental control as possible, obviously. And the other big thing is to measure relevant variables. Right? So um, if you have uh, um, Two, you want to compare uh, two treatment groups, right? Uh, people that uh, uh, go to AA and people that go to um, uh, a treatment program without any spiritual component. Right? And you can't, if you can't assign people to go to AA or not go to AA, right? you should, you're just looking at these existing groups, and it's a quasi-experimental study, and you and you want to uh, argue maybe that there's some effect of the spiritual component of AA. That these people will be different after doing their group than who did some other group that didn't have a spiritual component. So what you have to do is anticipate what people might say about that difference. So if you found the groups different and you said, oh, it's because of the spiritual component, other people would say, well, yeah, but uh, maybe the people that went to AA <coughs> um, were of higher SES or lower SES than people went to the other group. Right? So you try to anticipate any kind of relevant variables that people might say could explain your group difference, and you measure those, and you try to establish that your two groups are equivalent um, before you measure the dependent variable, because that's the whole uh, the one of the main goals of assigning individuals to levels of independent variable is to establish <coughs> uh, equivalency of groups before the intervention. That way, after the intervention is done, if they're different, it's because of the intervention, not because of some pre-existing difference. So measure any kind of relevant anything that might be relevant. Um, in terms of pre-existing differences that people would try to uh, criticize your study with, and then you can say, oh yeah, well, that could be, but these groups were actually exactly the same on that variable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, uh, one other thing with the quasi-experimental uh, research. Uh, statistically, uh, very similar to uh, experimental studies. And so, uh, Frequently, it's the exact same stuff. So, if you're looking at you know three groups, uh, you're going to be using an ANOVA. If it's two groups, you'd probably be doing a t-test. Uh, if it's just one point in time, uh, right? Um, which can be confusing because then you think, okay, um, I'm comparing these two groups and using a t-test, uh, and therefore, um, you know, I'm comparing maybe this AA group to this non-AA group. Do a t-test, and I okay, then clearly. Um, the spiritual component of A caused this difference. And you can't say that. And you may be tempted to say that because you use a t-test and you think, oh, a t-test is causation. No, all it is is a group difference. And you can try to make the theoretical kind of rational argument for why that difference uh, occurred in your argument would probably be for some cause effect relationship. But you have to be very careful in justifying uh, that. And the data don't justify that. You have to kind of rationally justify it based on other data and other kind of um, theoretical um, arguments. Okay. Uh, so correlational quasi-experimental quasi research um, probably more commonly used uh, in our field than uh, experimental research just because it's hard to assign people to groups in doing, doing clinical work. Um, so important to, to know about these, these designs uh, and the thing to keep in mind is just because it's not experimental doesn't mean that you have, you can forget about all the stuff we talked about with experiments. In terms of um, um, uh, uh, focusing on uh, validity and doing things the right way to uh, ensure that you're making valid conclusions, draw can, you can draw valid conclusions from your results. All those things still apply um, to both quasi-experimental and correlational research. Okay.